think uh, if I was to give a bit of a, uh, an intro to Rhett, it would be the fact that he's worn a lot of hats in his time. You know, uh, he has been a lawyer, he still is a lawyer. He has worked in FOSS as a, a case manager, I believe. He is also um, a recognized ASIC expert. And he, as well as working with businesses in that space, he's, he's, he's moved to doing it independently. So he has his own firm and some great team members in there, which I've just, just spoken to Nadia before we came on board. And he works with businesses who really do want to get top, uh, on top of this. So he's coming from a really interesting angle. Uh, he's also got, does some interesting things outside of, uh, outside of work too. He rides motorcycles, he rides horses. He is a man with, with a lot of interests. So not only are we going to get uh, gold in his subject matter expert, but maybe even get a few stories here and there about um, sort of his experiences in the industry and outside. So uh, without a shadow, a shadow of a doubt or any further delay, let me just reach over, uh, unmute Rhett and give you a big welcome. Are you there, Rhett? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Man. Let's get your video started and then we'll kick this bad boy down the road. Okay, so it's asking for me to start my video, which, okay, there we go. You should see me now. Can Lovely. You see? Good morning, sir. Are you there? I am. Good morning. There we go. How are you? Very good. Very good. Beautiful sunny day in Melbourne today. It's pretty good. To, uh, it's pretty good here too. I'm really looking forward to hopefully it'll be a, a, a nice sort of weekend. What have you got planned coming up this weekend? Well, I'm going to clean one of my motorbikes because for those of you who don't know, I lost my license and um, for speeding. <laughs> Why, don't just leave that? Why don't we just get straight there? Yeah, yeah. Lost, lost my license for speeding and I get it back next Wednesday and one of my bikes that I had an accident on before I lost my license had to get repainted and now I'm getting it wrapped. So I need to get it nice and clean before I get it wrapped. So that'll wow, be man. my weekend and maybe a bit of work. And what kind of motorcycles? I mean, are you a classic or are you just one of those, give me the fastest, most meaty Japanese production motorcycle and put me on a racetrack kind of guy? As long as it's got a Ducati badge, I don't care what sort of bike it is. <laughs> How did you get into motorcycle racing? Um, I hated sitting in traffic on St Kilda Road. So I bought a motorbike and then it just sort of progressed from there. I joined the Ducati club and then... I um, became the secretary of the Ducati Club and we go on rides. We're going to Europe next year and um, it's a lot of fun. I'm probably one of the younger members of the club, but we do track days at racetracks. We travel, uh, there'll be a convoy of us going to South Australia to ride at Macquarie Park and, um, and we also do rides in the hills. So I've got different bikes for different purposes. My wife's now a club member. She's about to upgrade to a massive bike. So it gets pretty addictive. So um, Nobby says the freedom of riding a bike is brilliant. Um, who's the better rider? Hey. <laughs> how, how, I mean, how do you judge a better rider? How, how, do, you, how do you assess that? Uh, well, I think a, a good rider um, is someone who is smooth. So when you're riding, say, two, I've got a person on the back, the smoother you can make it for them, the better it is. Um, when you're on a racetrack, the smoother you are, the better it is. So someone who... It's not just snapping on the gas, jamming on the brakes, that you're just smooth. And, uh, and they are the best riders. So some of the, some of the best riders, you know, blokes still in their 60s, 70s. I shouldn't say that because there's also some excellent female riders out there. But uh, older riders who've been doing it a long time, you know, learned, you know, had a few accidents, learned you know, from those accidents and just keep riding. Lost their license a few times, that sort of thing. Yeah, that too. <laughs> there's, so a there's, saying, a, there's a great story. There's a saying there racing, there's a saying racing, um, uh, Slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Yes, that's right. And I, th I think it works really well in business. It's just this idea that if you try and if you try and if you're not sort of taking it at a pace and you're not conserving your fuel and your energy, you end up wasting a lot of it, like wasting a lot of braking time and all the rest of it. It's the same when you're trying to do too much in a business, trying to implement too much at the same time, mm -hmm. you, you end up wasting a lot of time. And I think it's yeah, it works across a number of different things. Yeah, no, got to be smooth. Um, we could talk about horses and we could talk about, there's a, there's a commonality and basically yeah. you like things that you can jump on the back of. But for those of you who don't know you, and I reckon most people here do, but just give them a bit of, you know, what do you do? Who do you do it with? And what are the main problems that you yeah. tend to solve for them? Sure. Well, I used to say to people, there was typically two types of clients. We had the mopping up blood or heart attack clients. So they've had that heart attack or they're <laughs> bleeding out and we have to mop up their blood. Uh, we've, then got the clients that we work with who are um, who don't want to end like that, end up like that, 
Mm-hmm. But I think we've probably got a third category of client now as well. And they're the people who don't know they're going to have a heart attack. They're the people who don't know that they're about to um, succumb into some trouble. So they're an interesting type of client because obviously they require a lot of work, you know, trying to build a trust, take them on the journey and try to actually, you know, implement change in their business. And yeah. obviously when you can, it's, it's a great result for everyone. But, um, and usually those people are, uh, typically someone who's just got their license and um, and said, oh, okay, and I know I'm going to need some help. So whether they've received poor guidance from a different licensee or whatnot, but um, they're always a challenge. And I think there's been some changes with legislation in the last uh, two weeks um, around licensing. So for all of those advisors out there who are sole practitioners who are looking to get a license, um, ASIC's now got a new requirement or a new proof that you'll need to submit, which basically says, what are you going to do in the event that you can't work? What are you going to do in the event that you can't provide advice? So if you can't provide that proof, they probably won't give you a license. So, so this, is, this is the locum thing, right? Yeah. yeah. Is, that, is that what they so, call it, locum? Pretty much. And it's interesting because I know I've seen the list there and a couple of my clients are on, on this list today and, and I'm actually looking to connect two of them because um, they both had um, some health scares and, um, and they were you know, potentially... Fortunately, both of them are all okay, but you know, there was a period. There was a period there you know, because they fell off their bike. No, they didn't. Um, but there was a period there for both of them where they, you know, and, and particularly one of their wives, saying, "Well, I'm not an advisor. What would I do?" So yeah. it's probably it's probably a great thing that in communities like this, where we can say, "Well, look, this is my skill set. These are the sort of or the types of advice that I provide." Um, and um, you know, and in, in the event something happened to me, I could help you out, and, and vice versa. So how does it work? Do you so do you did you come in with a business and you set up a project or is it they kind of phone you where they got questions or do you have a defined sort of series of programs that you work with advisors through? I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in that. Yeah. Advice. Yeah. Look, we've got basic, we've got a basic package. We've tried different things like most businesses and some things worked and some things didn't. Uh, we used to see, we used to have a package where we'd see people once a year or see them twice a year, but they didn't really work. And they sort of attracted the people that we wouldn't believe they're actually aligned with what we do because we're very much bespoke and we're very much hands-on. And even when there's been uh, you know, minor, you know, small um, changes to legislation, it's very hard to communicate those changes. It's very hard to actually affect or uh, implement those changes across someone's business when you're only seeing them once or twice a year. So we elect now to only work with groups we've seen four times a year. Mm. It's a lot easier to keep people on track. Um, and you, but you basically become a part of the business. So you, you're implemented into their business. They call you when they have a problem. and um, and, and it's easy to answer their questions because you already know what's going on. So one of the things, um, you, you've got a bit really interesting background. I mean, you start, mm-hmm. you start off as a lawyer, right? Yep. And how did, the, how did you evolve from being a lawyer sort of slowly into what you do now? I mean, how, did that, how did that come about? Well, I was working on the Sunshine Coast. I used to, I'd, you know, I'd been at, when I grew up in Queensland and I was living on the coast and I got my first job as a lawyer on the Sunshine Coast. And I did a lot of advocacy work. Um, so we did a lot of work cover, but we did a lot of advocacy. And that was, um, that was the part of the job I liked the most, where I actually got to take my clients into court and I could advocate on behalf of them with a, uh, for a magistrate or a judge. Yep. And, um, and then I wanted to focus solely on criminal law, but there wasn't a lot of opportunity for that. And, um, and then from there, my wife, who's a so the double major in mathematics wasn't finding much work on the Sunshine Coast. So we ended up moving to Victoria and, um, and I got a job at Foz and then I uh, worked for a large dealer group. And from there, I um, decided after helping that dealer group through an enforceable undertaking and a ongoing monitoring program, you know, what's next? Yep. And I thought, no, I think I've got something to offer. So I did what most people do. You take that leap of faith and you, um, you jump and you jump without a parachute. And, and here I am nearly four years later. What's, um, I mean, what's, what's it like working at Foz? What's, uh, what are some stories that you can share which are particularly memorable? Uh, geez, it was, it was um, I think working at Foz, anyone who's worked in government, it's still very, even though it's a not-for-profit organisation, for those of you who didn't know that, it's actually not-for-profit. But... Um, it's got a very much government feel about it um, and uh, there's a lot of layers there. So I think what, what I like to do at FOS um, when I was there, I actually used to pick up the phone and just get people talking and say, look, can we try and resolve this you know, over the phone okay. rather than firing letters back and forth? Right. So, um, so I actually used to resolve matters quite quickly. So then you know, once you worked 
harder. They just made you work even harder by giving you more matters. <laughs> and, um, and I got to the stage where I could already see it was where I thought I really need to be out behind these walls and, um, and in the industry. And so then I um, was speaking to one of the panel um, panel members and I said to him, look, I'm looking to take this job. And, um, and the job is with PIS, for those of you who remember that name, well, it's still around. And he said to me, no, no, I would not work there. I would not work there. And I did it anyway. Um, and it was good because I think from a, at the time that dealer group was in a lot of trouble and from a compliance perspective, you know, we learned a lot and um, we got exposed to a lot of things and, and we didn't have the resources of large institutions. So if you needed something, you had to make it. So yeah, we basically just made our way. And, um, and then from there, I, um, you know, led the, led the, uh, the team through the, through the OMP. And then I stuck around for another year after that. And by which stage it was, it was time for me to do my own thing. Um, uh, I heard, I've heard stories about a PIS karaoke competition of sorts. Is, am I on the right track? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I remember those. Yeah, and it, it was, it's, it was done with quite a degree of seriousness, right? Because it was, if you yeah, did yeah, in well, the karaoke thing, it was. Yeah, we they used to they used to hassle the staff, and we used to have to run around and get people to, to you know with a bit of paper and get them signing up to go up on stage and sing and. And that's one of the job part of the jobs I hated the most. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that 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 did that did happen. Right. Um, a lot of other things happened too. Yeah. No. But, I've, um, I've, heard, I've heard some interesting stories. None of which we can probably tell here. But, but yeah. But look, we like I, I remember there was one classic story going back to Foz. You said there were some classic stories. There was one one person that came to Foz once and and he made a complaint <laughs> and he said that um, well, the, the advisor actually ended up complaining against him after he made a complaint and. The, the advisor um, wrote back in his submissions that the client said, if anything happens to my money, I will come back here with a gun and I will shoot you. Wow. And, um, <laughs> and he said, I can't lose any money. It's all the money I have in the world. Right. So I invested it. So I invested in as a high growth investor. Yeah. So it's interesting. <laughs> how do you, <laughs> I mean, how do you manage the risk associated with that in the first place? I mean, do, would you, how would you, would you put that on your questionnaire, which is if, if you lost all your money, would you A, be okay, mm. B, struggle, or C, come back with a gun and shoot your advisor? Is that an appropriate risk profiling question? Well, I think it is, actually. I think, I think it would have, it's, well, it should have clearly sent a message. This person couldn't afford to lose a cent but, yeah. uh, or wasn't prepared to lose a cent. But he, put him, he made him a high-growth investor, and he was a panel beater, and he, had a, he was supporting a family in the Philippines, and that was what the money was for. So that was probably one of the memorable ones. On this, actually, I've got a quick question. This is sort of off track. What's your view on the wholesale investor clause? The wholesale investor? Uh, no issue at all with the wholesale investor. I had plenty of those come through at FOS. So for those of you who are in that space, they do end up at FOS. Um, it's really up to, well, I should say AFCA now, but it's really up to AFCA whether or not they'll accept the complaint. And if they do accept the complaint, then, um, then you know, it's not a court and they'll treat it, um, treat the matter in a way that they believe is fair and reasonable in all the circumstances. There was one that stuck in my mind where a gentleman from the Sun, sorry, from the Gold Coast who had millions and millions of dollars and he went down to one of the local banks and he wanted to put the money into a term deposit and he said, um, and then he left and then the advisor gave him a statement of advice even though he shouldn't have and he was a wholesale investor and he complained to Foz and said, because um, he wanted his money out because he actually saw a turn deposit down the road that offered a better rate. So yeah. the, they refused to give it to him, so he lodged a complaint. I don't think that a person like that should really be using a service like, you know, the ombudsman to resolve their disputes, but they accepted that the, they accepted the complaint, he was entitled to do it, mm. and they lost out. And um, But I actually, because we get their addresses, so I actually did a Google image search of this person. He's got a beachfront property with a swimming pool and <laughs> millions of dollars in term deposits. So, yeah, he's stuck in my mind. But yeah, wholesale investors. Um, just had someone yesterday ring me and say, or email me and say, look, I'm I'm going down this path, and had spoken to a one of his dealer group provider services that he also uses in addition <laughs> to us, and and they've said, here's a letter that you can use, and the letter. It has the word advice all through it. I said, well, mm. no, wholesale investors, you can't give them advice. It's, you know, here's an offer doc, evaluate it and make a decision. So I still think there's a lot of people out there who don't really know what they're doing in that space. I have a, I have a family member who um, is getting, well, he's basically been investing through an accountant into a, a, a I think unlisted property trust it might be. 
And the irony is that the person who's signing the certificate is the account is the accountant who's investing the money. And this, <laughs> this person is not financially highly knowledgeable, but the second problem is this person can't afford to lose all the money. And I look at that and go, mm. that there's, there's a massive conflict if you're the person who's signing the certificate and investing them in your own property trust. And that's, that's the bit that concerns me about that particular loophole. Well, so yeah, I, I think, I think, yeah, look, if, if that person lost money <coughs> and they made that complaint, I, I don't think that an ombudsman or AFCO would have uh, any issue in, in saying, well, we're going to look at that complaint and potentially refund, you know, some right. money. There you go. There's the insurance policy. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm keen to dive into a little bit of sort of nuts and bolts, but I want to get, I wanted to ask you this question if it's cool. And by the way, if you have any questions, please people uh, pop them on because I want to make sure that we answer your questions, the things that you need to know in order to move forward over the next 12 months to get clear on, 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 on various different things. But if you were to look at the last 10 or 15 years of your career rep, what are the major mm -hmm. changes? You know, that whole thing about when you, that you put a frog in a pot, he doesn't notice it's being boiled. Yeah. Horrible thing. I don't know who tested that. Sometimes <laughs> you're in the landscape, so you don't realize the scale of change, but this is what you do for a living. What do you, what do you see as the main evolutionary points that have happened in compliance space? Um, well, it's funny that you talked about the opening of the <coughs> karaoke. I can remember when I was at one of those conferences and the karaoke was taking place. And, and I can remember back then, which was uh, quite some time ago now, um, you know, we were we were never really taken seriously. We were always the um, we were referred to as the sales prevention team. Um, <laughs> there was a lot of there was a lot of people who would say, "Oh, I'm compliant," and you think, "Well, actually, you're not." Um, but um, it was funny. I think around the turn of the um, the FOFA laws is when things really started to change for for us as a you know, as a group um, or a service provider, and I think that. Um, you could see it in the dealer groups where in the old days the um the BDMs were the you know were always rewarded and it was yeah. sort of a bit of a strange feeling, you know, when the the, com the compliance team was being looked upon as the um you know, as the sort of if you like the, the knight in shining armor. So um so I think yeah, definitely the attitude towards people like us and the services we provide has definitely changed and I'm not really sure. Um, I think at the moment it's probably reflected in the salaries because you know, we have trouble recruiting anyone because they're getting gobbled by the mediation programs at the banks. And, and I'm actually seeing advisors who are also saying, oh, well, I could work you know, a day or two a week in a remediation program and earn $500, you know, $500 a day from the work. So, yeah. um, so, we, so we've, we've seen that, um, which makes it very difficult for, for businesses like us to compete with those sort of things. But obviously, um, that might stop one day and those people might be without work. But I think um, other things that we're seeing or I've seen, if I had to look back over time, um, I think that um, you're starting to see a more professional type of compliance provider. So, you know, I mean, it, it, I think one of the, if I had to, if I had a crystal ball, I'd say that there will come a time where compliance providers will have to be regulated. Um, just as you know, advisors are having to go through the, the FASIA requirements. You know, anyone could set could set up shop tomorrow and and say that they're a uh, compliance provider. Um, mm. You know, everyone in our team is going to go through and and do the study for FASIA and ensure that we have the same level as well. Otherwise, it all feels a little bit hypocritical. But um, but I think that you'll definitely see that also start to creep in from from where we stand. Love it. Okay, and um. There's been obviously we're seeing a, a we've seen a trickle towards uh, independence, but now it seems to be a bit of a flood in terms of advice. Are you what are you what's your view on that and how that's that is impacting what you do? Um, like I think it's funny you know, we're seeing you know obviously people shift away from from the large institutions and they're moving towards um, to becoming self licensed and you know you only have to see the numbers to, to back up that data. Yeah. But I think that's also impacting the way that advice is provided and at the moment we're seeing quite a lot of people um, who are moving away um, and moving into different sorts of solutions be it an, you know, an mda solution or an sma solution yeah and that also has um, you know the potential for for conflicts that need to be appropriately managed and a lot of the groups that we um, work with um, 
you know, are on that journey to make sure that their conflicts are appropriately managed. And, um, and it, again, as a way of protecting themselves because you don't know what you don't know. And uh, for most people, they weren't going to sit down and read the decision, or not the decision, sorry, the Royal Commission report. Um, but there's actually quite a lot of useful information there about the way that conflict should be or could be managed. And I think we'll see more, um, uh, you know, this, oh, look, the conflict's disclosed, so therefore it's managed. That's, you know, that's old thinking. Um, we'll see more now of, well, how are, you know, businesses being proactive to manage conflicts and how are they um, being proactive in terms of ensuring that their clients are, you know, it's a best interest obligation, not a, you know, a good enough um, requirement. And that was obviously made very clear the yeah. Commission. So, so let's, we're, seeing, we're seeing that. Let's dive into the the Royal Commission, all the changes that have come about. And um, by the way, if there's, I'm, I'm going to suggest some areas that we can talk about, Rhett, if you want to sort of jump in mm-hmm. and, and mention, and if anybody's got one. I think for me, the big ones mm-hmm. that I think really get important to get is ongoing service and advice. That's a big one uh, that's come mm-hmm. out. I think FASIA is um, a lot of questions coming up about that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I think I think um, I think reviews. I know it's part of ongoing service, but I think the review is a big one. What are some other areas that we should be talking about if we if we're talking about you know finding that middle ground between profitable and compliant? What are the areas that businesses need to master or get their heads around in order to? I think they need to. Oh, you go. Yeah. No, far away. I think that I think they need to also think about well, who's my ideal client? Um, and that all ties back into what's my investment philosophy. Um, are there things that, and I think that's probably where our business is your business and our business actually <laughs> have synergies because, you know, they can hear it from you and they um, advisors can hear it from our perspective as well. But I think we're actually saying the same thing, but maybe just um, in a slightly different way. I think so, I, I totally agree. And that's what, when we, when we work together, we do that session um, we kind of agreed that we were going to top and tail it and I'm glad it worked because at the end of the day, you know, it's the whole thing. You can go out and tell people to, to run their business a certain way, but if, if it can't be managed, they, it can't be, you know, they haven't got the capacity or they haven't got the, the time or they just can't do it and it's going to fall down. They're going to cut corners. And similarly, someone like me, I can go out and tell people to do it this way and that way and that way. But ultimately, if it's, if it's not compliant or it's not going to work, then sooner or later, there's going to be an issue. And mm-hmm. that's why I found working or having that discussion with you was really, really powerful. Mm, yeah, me too. So, I think, from your perspective, why, oh, yeah. why, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> from your perspective, why ideal client? I mean, of all the things we could talk about, uh, the, 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 the legislation doesn't talk about ideal client, doesn't talk about niching. Why would you no. it as being an area that businesses well, need to master? Well, I think it ties into a lot of things. And, and look, I, I preface what I'm about to say with, yeah, the, the, the issue that the industry has, and I'll, I'll give you an example. We were negotiating a, a contract the other day with a, with a service provider. Uh, we're going to provide some services to a client. And they got a lawyer involved, and yes, I'm a lawyer as well. But I, I came incredibly frustrated by the process because the lawyer involved just didn't really understand what we do. Yeah. So they were trying to impose or, or throw all these terms and conditions into agreement that actually made the agreement unworkable um, or you know, made it a lot less attractive. And so it took a lot of explaining to, to them to, to say, well, look, you, know, you don't really understand what we do. And um, eventually we got there and we got over the line. But if I, if I take that same analogy with you know, a lot of people that we're dealing with at ASIC, you know, they know what the law is, but they don't really understand and they've never really worked um, in financial advice businesses. And it becomes incredibly frustrating when you're trying to work with them to say, well, here's the solution or here's, you know, could this work? Because they see things that are very black and white. So I think when you're talking about um, ideal clients or ideal advisors and, and what that means, you know, the, the aspects of the world will only apply the legislation and say, well, you know, you need to make sure that when you're providing, excuse me, advice that, that you know, that um, the goals or objectives are specific and measurable. They'll also want to know what the, the literacy or the financial literacy of the client is and, and how are you capturing that. Yeah. They'll want to know, well, what's the client's capacity to, to, you know, to pay, what's their objective timeframes, you know, their investment experience. And, and I think you know, most businesses at the moment, we see a lot of what I would call as a shoehorning or a, trying to squash a square peg into a round hole as part of 
uh, you, know, the, you know, capturing the client, and they're really not your ideal client. And, and if I give you another example, most complaints take place because there's a failure to provide information. That's the reality of it. People aren't informed, they don't understand. And um, a couple of weeks ago, my wife, um, she was in a car accident and she ended mm. up in hospital. And she'd actually been to that hospital previously because she'd fallen off a horse and ruptured a spleen and broke a collarbone. Yeah. And she had a really bad experience in that hospital. And then she ended up back in the same emergency department mm-hmm. and didn't want to stay. And she didn't want to stay because she sits there in hospital and no one ever tells her what's going on. So he's just sitting there, you know, hooked up to a machine and she wants to know what's going on and no one can tell her. And, um, and they say, oh, don't worry, everything's being monitored from you know, another ward back, you know, wherever. But when I arrived there, the alarm was going off and it's going beep, beep, beep. And he said, don't worry, it's been going off for five minutes. So I think, you know, finding out, if I relate that back to an ideal client, not <coughs> everyone, just like our business, we're not going to have, you know, every client because they won't be ideal to us. We need to have the same value systems. We need to have the same belief systems. We need to be agreeing on where we're going to go. And I think um, when you've got a regulator that's watching what you do, I want to make sure that you're um, meeting everything from a legislative requirement, but then you as a business owner, as an advisor, also need to balance that out with how that ideal client's going to fit uh, with all of those competing interests, if you like. Mm. Can we just touch on technology? Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that's changed, I mean, it wasn't that long ago that if you had a filing cabinet, uh, the licensee would send the auditor, they'd come and check out a few files and then they'd look at them and and go back and that was that, right? And now Mm. you've got certain licensees out there that they're putting forward the attitude that all of your documents, everything isn't in their chosen financial planning software, then you are non-compliant. What technology are you seeing out there that is making the process of either file, uh, capturing information, you know, rec- record keeping, whatever it, that, that advisors really yeah. should be focusing on getting their heads around? Or is it not technology at all? What's your, what's your view? Look, we are technology agnostic. So okay. we, don't, we don't say that you should use a certain type of technology. Yep. I think it's like anything. If you're, you know, I could go out and buy you know, a, a Desmo Sedici, which is a very expensive Ducati, but I'm probably not up to the level of riding that bike. And I find that that's also with a lot of the advisors with whom we work, where they will say, okay, I've just gone and invested a whole lot of money, whether it's my x plan solution or whatever, but I don't really know how to use it. So, yeah. so when people like us come along and we say, well, look, we need to review some of your files, they say, oh, I'll give you a link um, to my solution. And you can come in through there, but then they haven't really got a framework in place. So the documents aren't really named properly. They're not really stored in the right place. And I think, you know, if, if a regulator came knocking and you went, you were to say to a regulator, well, here's, you know, just come in through here. Well, firstly, I'd strongly advise you against that. But, yeah. um, but you know, it, sometimes it actually makes things worse. And I was speaking to a licensee a couple of, um, couple of months ago who said to me, um, and he's, his license is not aligned to any of the large institutions, but he has got quite a few advisors. And he said to me, if I had my time again, he said, some days I wonder if I should have just said to the advisors, you use what technology you want to use and you're most comfortable with. Yeah. Because he just got so sick and tired of the arguments and the, you know, the back and forth because um, he found it was wasting time. So technology is good if you know how to use it. Yeah. Technology is good if you can find those savings, but sometimes, um, you know, I think the biggest inhibitor of that is people that don't know. So I they don't know, or they don't invest enough time. Let's say we rem- we come back from the technology, and you're looking at mm-hmm. a, uh, you're you're saying to an advisor, there's one area that you could get better at, which is going to straight away it's going to improve your ability to produce the documentation and and do do the you know tick those boxes. Is it would you suggest just get get focused on the process for creating the perfect files, or get get really good at File noting, what's the one thing that you would say, or maybe it's not one thing, maybe it's a couple of things that would just make things so much easier that most advisors aren't doing? There's a couple of things, and I probably, you know, well, hopefully don't upset too many people with this comment, but when I look at advice that's done well, um, it's, it's clear, it's concise, it's, it's straight to the point, and it's customised for the client. Where we see advice done badly, it's usually been produced through an advice builder. 
And the, the advisor has just relied on a lot of template text, so the technology. I think from, for a lot of advisors, and again, I, and this is probably where we have this, um, if you like, push and pull factor where you've got a regulator who's very much focused on the legislation, but you've got a lot of advisors who are not really focused too much on the legislation. And you know, when you look at what, what, that, what are the things that make a good advisor, people say, you know, you need to be able to communicate with clients, you've got to be able to build strong relationships. Uh, you've got to be able to to do a number of things, but it doesn't really say, oh, you need to be able to have a, a, a good command of the legislation. Yeah. And and I think that's probably, you know, <laughs> if you could get a better grasp of what it is that you were actually asked to do, then you could implement that into your technology solution. And and that would produce high quality advice. Um, there was an ASIC report that came out, I think it's called Report 562, and it was referred to in the Royal Commission said that 75% of files reviewed by ASIC in this report are uh, best interest. And, and I've sat down with so many different practices. And, and before best interest, it was the Know Your Client, Know Your Product, which was the 945A legislation. Yep. And I don't like to talk a lot about legislation with people because it puts people to sleep. But the whole point of best interest was it was supposed to make it easier for people to follow. By if you, if you followed these steps, you'd get there. But I don't think as an industry, we've really got there yet. So let me, I mean... It's interesting you say that. I'm going to play devil's advocate here for a second. If you look at the yep. legal profession, and I was speaking to, mm-hmm. a, a, having lunch with a, a friend of Zoraida Ifans, who's, who, who is an advisor I work with in Canberra, and her person I was having lunch uh, di- or dinner with, high-ranking lawyer in government. And I sort of got in a conversation, like, how do, you, how do you manage your time having to look through all these documents over and over again? And he explained it clearly. He says, as a first-year lawyer, everything's new. And then after two or three years, you kind of look at something and straight away, you're like, I recognize what that is. I recognize what that is. And you kind of start, you start to look for, instead of reading everything, you look for the inconsistencies, the new things. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the legal profession has a, has a history of writing in language that is so dense and so complicated. And most of the time, these clauses mm. are a repetition of other things. Now, you bring it over mm. here, and we've got this document that has certain requirements in there, but with a lot of advisors are being sort of criticized and I'm not, not, not having crack at you for using mm. templating. The other point is mm. um, you go to sort of, the, I'm, I'm, I'll have a crack at the FPA on this. You go to their site and you download their templated SOA and it's horrible. Mm. It's, it's, mm. it's not only is it ugly, it's poorly formatted. Mm. The, what, what, what advice would you give to, to advisors out there who they don't want to write an 80 page document. They look at it and they go, this no. is awful. But, they're, they're sort of they're being pushed often by their licensee to produce something so horribly difficult and, and dense. What what what's what would you recommend to them? And is there an example of an SOA which they can go and look at and really get inspired that there is there is something out there that's not going to take I, three hours to put together? And I think this is a danger. Again, we as a group, because we're compliance providers, we're not SOA builders, but I will say this, and for those of you who saw Stuart and I speak. Um, I talk a lot about, uh, he, he referred to some matrix examples, and yes. I talk about that there is no spoon. You know, the, the legislation is the legislation. You know, the only thing that, you know, they can bend is you. Just like, just like with the license, if I want to drive, which I really do like driving, um, <laughs> I've, got to, I've got to drive between, you know, certain speed limits, yeah. which frustrates me. And, I, and look, I'll give you my own, my own views. You know, there's lots of accidents taking place in Victoria at the moment. And I think it's because speed limits have been dumbed down so much that people now feel the urge that they're not challenged. And they pick up their phone and go, I can drive and text at the same time. And I think this is a problem that we've got with financial advice too, that, you know, you really do need to, if, 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 I, could, if, if I was to say to, an, to a practice, do, do, do this one thing, I would say, Sit down and invest some time in understanding the legislation and how that is transferred into your advice document. And then you will find, because you will know what can go in and what doesn't need to go in. And our rules, rules were made to be broken. <laughs> um, but, if you, but if you then knew what could go in and what didn't go in and you knew that there is no spoon, that's you that can bend around the spoon and you'll have a situation where you're, you're actually, your advice documents will reduce greatly in size yeah. because you actually know. But like you said, it's, the, the first year lawyer, when I was a first year lawyer, I remember just reading and reading this thing over my eyes. I used to get stigmatisms because my eyes would flicker. It doesn't happen anymore because you know your way around it. And I think yeah. a good practice will, will know how to get around it. And, and by virtue of the fact, you have the knowledge. 
they don't teach you. I don't think they teach you that when you're um, when you're starting out as an advisor. No, that's 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 fair. That's fair. Look on that on that uh, mm. analogy. Sorry, my phone just rang. That means I'm I'll, I'll pay for the beers. Um, <laughs> I, I remember I used to. I don't know if anyone's ever challenged uh, a road a, a fine or a, or a parking ticket. And you know what a lot of people are, I used to do is you phone and you come up with all these reasons why they should let you off. Oh, you know I was having a bad day and I was late and. You know, there was somebody I, I had to drop my wife off and she's got a sprained ankle or what. And the first time I got a, got a fine about a year ago and I was driving without registration and I didn't know because, <laughs> and I thought, I, I thought, you know what, I, rather than just write the whole, oh, I didn't know, I'm a nice person, I go and look at the, the page. And if you actually go to the New South Wales government, there's only five way, reasons you can get off a, t- a fine. One of them mm. is if you've got 10 year driving record. The second one is if you uh, can demonstrate that you are going through a period of t- hardship. Uh, and the mm. third thing I think is, if you can demonstrate that you immediately, like took action almost immediately. And I just wrote that in email. I was like, uh, at the time, Rachel had been in hospital with the kids. I hadn't been to the office for two months. I've been working from home a lot because she'd been ill, Nate had been ill, I had a 10 year driving record. And on top of it, I, de- I said to them, as soon as I got fined, I went and I reinstated the, uh, the rego all the way back. And by the way, the car was also uh, insured by, by NRMA because they've kept charging me for that. They dropped it. But the whole point is mm. I had to go in and understand that the person who was going to be reading this didn't care about my mm. sob story. They had five, if they could tick one or more of these boxes, they had permission mm. to let me off. So that's the mm. thing. If, as a, to your point, and this is what really I took from that session. It's, it's like the trick is, it's like the Yuri Geller thing. The, the, the spoon will not bend. The law isn't going to bend, mm. but there are certain clauses, there are certain things it expects, and there's also certain things that, 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 it, mm. that it allows. And the trick is to structure your business so it's yeah. not trying to push up against it. It's moving around with it. That was the real point I took from it. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah, just there. There is no spoon. Like, you know, and I guess it's, there's people who offer services like us, and we'll show you. There is no, and we'll show you how to bend, and we'll show you what can bend and what can't bend, and obviously things will break. Yeah. But, you know, that's, you know, that would be, I think, for anyone. You know, and, that's, and that is a long-term thing. It's like learning another language. You know, you're going to have to sit down and make the time. Yeah. So. It absolutely is. Yeah. Let's talk about ongoing service because this is a big one. Yeah. I'm going to fire yeah. some questions at you. People keep it coming. Uh, so if, if you need to do a renewal, annual renewal is coming down the pike, why mm-hmm. not just uh, sign the client up, invoice them, and then re-sign them again, and you don't have to do that? whole thing uh, where do we start well there, there's a little bit of legislation that we might need to go through um but the, the again it, it comes back to the fact that you've got you know people who are working for a regulator who don't understand what a, a financial advice business really does yeah. and i and i say that with the greatest respect which means i'm being disrespectful but but that is the, that is the issue um and so again we need to bend around them and now, there is nothing in the legislation that says how you can conduct a review. It just says do a review. So yeah, that's where that. the gray area is. Yeah. So the gray area could be, well, you know, I don't have to do it in person. Um, you know, can I do it over the phone? Can I do it like this? Um, Brett, there is so much to read. Tell me where to start, the best place to start. <laughs> For those of you who are interested in these things, my email address is ret, R-H-E-T-T, at icompliance.com.au. But if you want to write a, a decent advice document, what I would say is focus on, if you can Google it. Just Google 961B, uh, 2A, 96, 961G. 961B, yep. 2A? Cap, yeah, capital B, capital, capital B. Yep. Capital B. Because that, that's... So then, and, and, that's it. and if you want to get really technical, that's in round brackets. Good grief. Okay. And, and then you've got number two in round brackets, A to G. Read that. Yep. 961 capital G. Yep. 961 J. 961 in brackets, J. Yep. Yep. And if you can master those three things... Um, and obviously 947, if you're replacing products, 947 capital D. That's the hardest one to master. That's why it's last. Okay. But if you can master those in your advice documents, if you can improve your knowledge and understand what they really mean, then you could make someone like me redundant. Woohoo. And you can ride more. Yes. 
So if you, if you can master what they say, those four, you'll nail what, it. What they mean. Yeah, if you can master it practically, in practical terms, what that means. And I'll give you, um, just while we're talking about this, that, that last example there, the 947D, that ASIC report I talked about before, where they, that ASIC report where they said 75% of advice is, um, didn't meet best interest, which is 961B, 75% of the advice didn't re meet that requirement. Yeah. And by virtue of the fact that it didn't meet the B, it also failed in the G. But so that's the appropriateness right there. Yep. I'm moving to the camera to point it. Um, and then ASIC said there was about 10% of those advices that breached J. Now, J is what we call, I call it jail, J for jail. If you are breaching 961J, you're putting the client's interest before your own. And yep. ASIC also said where they found that clients or advisors were not meeting the B and they were actually failing um, the, not the replacement product that were requirements which is the 947d because the advisors just don't know how to articulate why the product replacement is in the client's best interest so on the face of it again with the regulator that just reads legislation um, you're now replacing products into a, a product where it's for your benefit and not the clients and that's the issue gotcha it's interesting we had that conversation again about Zoraida and her situation getting caught in there so it's not perfect every time but I won't can I, um, Ursula makes a really good point. Let's, let's, let's answer that question. If someone's listening to you and go, okay, you know what? I am going to monitor this stuff. I'm going to read, uh, I'm going to read yep. what's coming out and I'm, I'm going to get my head around it. What are the best yep. two to three, or maybe it's just one, one source of information that should be in, on your, you know, weekly reading list? <sighs> um, <clears throat> I don't Dude, I can't. I, I can't believe it. Actually, I don't. I don't have a solid answer for you on that. I think um, uh, the AFCA decisions or FOS decisions are a good place. If you read one or two FOS decisions a week, um, you'll see how they apply the law. Yeah. Um, because you don't see a lot of this stuff end up in court, so you can't go and read too many court decisions. And I wouldn't recommend that anyway, because they're you know, my father who was a was a doctor said, um, you, know, you know, bloody judges it takes them, you know. Know, it's 20 pages to say what they could have said in one. So, um, so yeah, so read the AFCA Oz decisions would be a good place to start. Okay. And I think, you know, um, case, case studies. So, you know, we run case studies all the time. Um, so they are, you know, and we can tell you, we can say, well, this is why it failed or this is why. And, and also just being in, invested in your own file audits, you know, by, by learning from the file audits. Um, so you can understand how to apply the legislation conference. And obviously ASIC does the, the regular papers as well, which would be worth reading when they come out. Yeah, but I, I find the biggest criticism most people say is that they just don't understand, you know, if you read a, an ASIC reg guide, you know, that some of the examples out there just don't really relate to financial advisors and they say, oh, you know, I can't really, you know, it's not really talking to me and, and I find that too. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, those um, ASIC decisions are always a good one to read. Let's talk about the review thing because I'm running a, a webinar next week. Oh yes, sorry. Yep. I'm running a webinar next week yep. called Renovator Review. It's a module that has been really popular. And obviously, moving forward in the pricing space, this idea of bundling together, oh, we think, you know, we'll include one statement of advice in there a year, we'll include two reviews. It's, it's not really going to work anymore because increasingly, you're probably going to get to a place where if you've not delivered that, uh, then you're probably going to have to refund it. So the first, I mean, we can talk yep. a little bit about what do you do when, um, you know, for example, you, you, you have to have a client come in and they're like, no, no, you know what? It's fine. You look after it. That, that's kind of a different situation, but that's an area that's mm. going to change. But mm. when we had that conversation, we said, well, what if, what if it's not in the client's best interest to do a review? You know, you've, you've been through a process and you've spoken to them and you're pretty comfortable mm. that you would put out a, a, a document or a, like a record that would say, you know what, we've analysed, there's nothing has changed, let's keep going with what we're doing. Let's not, we don't need to sit down mm. for an hour and a half and talk about everything. In that case, it, it is in the client's best interest not to charge them the 600,000 bucks a year for that review. But obviously, we've got to be really, really clear mm. about how that works. You, you with me? Yeah, look, if you, again, I'm, I'm not suggesting that people go and read the case law. I mean, I, I read the case and thought it was quite interesting, but there's a case called McDonald v. AMP Financial Advice, PTY LTD. Yep. If you Google that, you can read a summary of that case because that case talked, it went to the Supreme Court and it talked about hold RLAs where the, the, the advisor had gone to see these clients and, had, and the clients 
had the advisor formed the view that there were no changes required to be made to the client's circumstances. Mm. So the advisor was arguing, well, I actually did have a review or we did talk and there was no changes. So we didn't do anything. We didn't you know, give them a document. Unfortunately, the court disagreed. And the court said, look, you need to do a hold ROA. You, know, you need to basically say that I will look. You know, my advice is to hold your position and therefore um, you need to produce the ROA. The thing about ROAs is you need to be able to, uh, within seven years of giving a record of advice, even if you don't give the advice in writing, is reproduce it. And I think where we're getting a bit of ambiguity or misunderstanding is that um, a lot of dealer groups insist on the actual physical document being on file. But if you're seeing a client or you're speaking to a client over the phone and they're saying, look, I don't want to come in and you ask them some key questions such yeah. as your circumstances changed, no, has anything changed, then you can satisfy yourself that um, their position or you know, nothing's changed and therefore they're holding their position. Provided you can, you've got a decent enough file note that you could go back within you know, seven years in the event you were called upon to produce that ROA, then you would be okay. Yeah. I think best practice would be to actually have the ROA. But I hear what you're saying. And unfortunately, that the legislation, again, we need to bend or you know, look at the spoon and, and go, there is no spoon and bend around it and say, well, the yeah. legislation says, uh, and ASIC's interpretation of the legislation is also that if you are charging ongoing fee to a client for more than 12 months, um, then you need to be providing the ongoing service. And I guess the, the point is that what's in that service is, is, is the question that comes up. So if you're charging, um, yeah. I guess the two ang angles we said, if you're charging an all-inclusive, you know, $5,000 a year, and if we dive underneath, mm. it, that includes, you know, two, let's say, well, 5,000 you wouldn't be doing, one review, you know, it's, it's looking after these strategies. And you come mm. to that point where, oh, we don't need to do a review. Well, then in theory, that then you've got, to, you've got to take away the cost of that review. And, and according to the legislation, you've got to refund it, right? Well, that's the, yeah. And, 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 and look, the, the legislation is, in, is as specific, but it's <coughs> ASIC who says, we believe that the review is what most clients uh, will get most value from. So yeah. if you haven't seen them and the bulk of that 5,000, or in ASIC's view, the bulk of the 5,000 is for the actual review. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, we can argue until we're blue in the face, uh, unless we've got someone with a lot of money who wants to drag ASIC into court. But at the moment, there's no case law I can rely on. And the issue that we've got is that they believe that it's the review, which is where all the value is. So, okay. As, as well, I mean, but a part of that is also ongoing communication, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the other option absolutely. is, if you, it's, it's an opportunity, I think, for businesses, if you want to work with people, you know, you turn around and say, well, the fee is 4,000. And part of that includes, we will sit down at a certain, oh, wow, one, six and a half million pounds. That's awesome. Oh, <laughs> I'm out of here. Um, All right, see ya. <laughs> go at that point. But we have to agree that, you know, once or twice a year, we're going to have a, we're going to check some data. And we're going to have a conversation. Mm. And at that point, if we decide, if I make the recommendation, there's been significant changes, then you would, yeah. you potentially would charge for the review at that point. Well, if, it, if it's an ongoing fee, then you need, yeah, you still need to charge. I mean, the, there's, a, there's a couple of things that um, I'm not sure if everyone's aware, but we're looking at now forward-looking SOA, sorry, forward-looking FDSs. So uh, it was a recommendation that came out of the Royal Commission that you're going to have to, at the start of the agreement, say, look, this is what we're looking to do. And then um, and at the end of the 12-month period, say, here's your, your FDS on what you got, what you paid, and, and what you actually received. So yeah. The, the, the sort of constricting um, or, or removing more of the grey area as well. So that's becoming, well, that's going to become problematic for us. Okay. Um, I think, again, yeah, it, it, I think this just really reinforces more of this sort of ideal client that I spoke about at the start, yeah. which is if the, the ideal client has to want to engage, you know, if the yeah, client says, agreed. look, next year, I, I just, I can't be here, then you're really playing Russian roulette with, you know, with these people because you've got a regulator who was saying, this is how we, how we see the law and how we're going to apply it. So, Love it. Um, yeah. So I mean, that, that review piece is, is difficult. I know I get criticized by a lot of people when I say, well, um, look, if you say to the client, I'll just renew the agreement once a year and not give you an FDS. Um, you know, in my view, that's anti avoidance because um, the true, meaning of if you if you took that as a strategy and said well look i'm not going to give the client fds because i review the agreement or sorry i get them to um 
I, you know, I only sign them up for less than 12 months per year. The ASICs of this world are going to say, well, there's part of that you should be turning off the fee and then turning the fee back on when you get the new agreement. And I don't think anyone who's doing that um, is actually, or subscribing to that school of thought, is actually turning the fee off and turning it back on. So it just looks like you're receiving an ongoing fee without providing the client with an FDS. Look, Matt, I, I, we've spoken about this. I think the opportunity is there for the review is to make it something that clients want. And uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I've been working in the coaching space for 50, well, it's coming up for 19 years now. I've worked with personal trainers and the value of giving clients that benchmark, that accountability for let's review how far you've come, what's been good, and let's, let's plan out the next year. I think it's just, it's, it's untapped. And when you get that right, when you get the conversation, you frame it right, you, you connect people with the big picture that mm. they've forgotten about, they will pay for it and they'll, they'll be part of it. Yeah. Nobby's point is, yeah, it's, it's moving forward. It's, it's, got, it's got to be about actively getting to engage and understand that the reviews just, is not just something that it's a check-in. It's a huge part of um, making sure that you, you're on track, making sure you, you're optimizing things. And most importantly, just making sure that you know, you've got somebody who's pushing you to do, do things and achieve the goal. That's my take on it. I think it's huge. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think you know, if you've got clients that don't want to engage with you, they're problematic because you don't really know what's going on in their world and then they're likely to turn around again. As I said, like, if there's no information or a lack of information, they're the ones that are going to, um, to complain. They're the ones that are going to cause you know, the, the, um, the problems for you down the track. I've, uh, I've known we've got about five minutes to go. I'm happy to stick on a bit longer if you are. But I wanted to, um, mm -hmm. uh, by the way, if you're on the program and you want to hear more from Rhett, you can go to uh, under masterclasses is a recording from Rhett's session at the accelerator called Dust is Compliance. That was my, my, my fault. Uh, where we talk about a whole bunch of stuff, MDAs, conflicts, and a whole bunch more. And it was a fantastic session. But for those of you, for those who are listening who potentially have got to go because it's getting close to 11 o'clock, if they wanted to know more, either they got questions for you or is there something they can do to, you know, connect with you or, yeah. or, or help? Sure. We, we are running um, and, we, and we usually charge clients um, who are not ongoing clients of ours or working with one of our partner groups. We would charge them um, to do this, but we're running a, we've had a couple of our clients now say, look, we really need some, some RM training. So we're going to run something in a similar format to this okay. on the 8th of, um, on the 8th of August, I think it was the Friday, on the Friday, so it's either the 8th or the 9th of August. And if you're in this group and you wanted to attend, um, it's, it'll, it'll be complimentary, but okay. it'll give you an idea of how we work and what we do. And all those questions that you've got, chances are lots of other people on the call will have those questions too. Okay. And we will be facilitating that. So if you email me again, um, I'll get that invite out to you. Okay. And what's that normally cost? Uh, we charge 300 per office. So, you know, if there's 10 people in your office, you know, it's the same price, but, okay. um, but it, it, it will run for, it'll run for um, about two to three hours, depending okay. on how much um, excitement it generates. <laughs> and what's the, what so we'll go through those, well, we'll go through those case studies. So, you know, where people can try and learn more about the, the legislation and we'll, and, and, we'll, and we'll show how they're being applied as well okay so it's beautiful if anybody's interested in that uh what can they, they email you or do you want to do you want to put yeah put just, in there? Yeah, you, yeah you just send it either to ret or info info at icompliance.com.au info at icompliance and if you think you're interested in that you can also put your name in the box and uh, I'll sh i will put your email address and I'll, I'll just flag it with uh Rhett when we get off the call yeah, Dude, yeah it'll is, be about nine it'll be 9 a.m in the morning um, oh, yeah. so wrapped up before midday. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay, cool. Sounds good. Um, I think I was talking about coming along to that because I'm really interested. I might be in, uh, I might be in Sebu that day. So we'll see how we go. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, we could keep talking about this and we're just scratching the surface of, of what's coming, but I want to just finish mm -hmm. by saying, you know, where do you see the industry uh, in, you know, two years, three years from now? What do you, where do you, what, what, how do you think it's going to change? And what do you think the opportunities are? Well, well I was, I was in Sydney on Tuesday uh, working with a client who knows that they could have a heart attack and doesn't want to. And they're one of the best clients to work with. And yep. we were walking. Um, I said to him, let's go and have a bite to lunch. And for those of you who are in Sydney and know where Gas Lane is, there's a really <laughs> steep hill that you've got to walk up to, to get up Gas Lane. 
And we just had a big lunch and we're walking up that hill and he was breathing heavily. And I thought, yeah, actually I'm going to have a heart attack. But, um, he, um, but yeah, he was complaining to me about the fascia. I said, oh, you know, I've got ample experience. I, I do the right thing and, and I know he does the right thing. Um, but he doesn't want to do it. And I had to say to him, look, you know, people are leaving on mass. You're young. You've got, you know, if you do this, you know, it's going to be harder for people to get in. I think we are going to see you know, the reduction in numbers, and I've said that before, but I think we are going to see, for those of you who, and you've heard me say this, who can survive this period, you will flourish. Yeah. So I think we will see less, less advisors. That is the future. I think with some of the other changes that ASIC made uh, to new licensees, they're now asking for proofs around your compliance programs. They're asking for proofs around how you meet conflicts of interest. So... There is going to be, whether you like it or not, a bigger emphasis on you know, on that compliance space. So more practices are going to either have to make the budget for compliance um, or find a way or find a way to do it because it's it, it's not getting any easier. It's actually getting harder. So if you if you are going to succeed as an independent you know, independent practice, you're yeah. Funnily enough, it's going to be that part being driven to become very process orientated. But I yeah. guess the benefit is if. It's like working with overseas staff. The moment you start doing it, mm. it kind of forces mm. you to get your communication yeah. right, get your structure your weeks, yeah. get your technology right. So on the flip side, it's kind of one of those yeah. things that sometimes, sometimes the things that you're forced to do end up being a benefit if you can get it, get it the right way. So, mm. Absolutely. Dude, this has been, uh, yeah. as always, enlightening. I'm looking forward to sort of, um, if I can come along with the RM training, that'd be awesome. I'm also looking forward to spending some time mm-hmm. with you. We get the date in the diary. Mate, is, um, is there anything else you wanted to mention or talk about or, or just sort of put out there? Look, we, we always do try to market ourselves or position ourselves as, you know, we're not trying to come across as negative. And I know that it's not the sexiest subject, but, you know, we really are very, um, you know, we do very bespoke work. And, um, and you know, if you come to us <laughs> with a problem, we'll try to you know, actually produce solutions. Now, they might not always be palatable, but... I think you've just got to get in that mindset, um, you know, that you know, we can always work through things. And, um, and that's really, I think, what we're about. Beautiful. Love it. Um, this has been really good. I've loved it. Um, Excellent. Mate, what's, uh, so when do you get your license pack? Wednesday. Oh, Taking a day off work. That would be good. Mm. Okay, are you going, are you going to a track or? No, we we'll take the bike to get the bike wrapped. And... Oh, yeah, I'm just going to enjoy driving. Don't go too fast. That's all it is. Do me a favor. Uh, could you just pop in the box and let me know what's the one thing that you've taken from the conversation today, which you think would <laughs> be useful? Uh, what's the one thing that you've Thanks. taken? Thanks, you Richard. Useful? And if you'd like to know more about, that'd be good. Just type in the box and let me know. Uh, Nobby says, can you help with a red light camera court appearance? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah, have you got um, um, the best thing, Nobby, is get a, get a picture of the picture? And the bottom line is if you're over the line, you're over the line. It's, it's pretty hard to, uh, to, to, to offset that one. Uh, Roshan says, ride it like you stole it. <laughs> if I stole a bike, I'd be riding it quite slowly. I have to be honest. That's just me. Ian, thank you so much. First cab off the rank. He mentions that continue to be proactive on this stuff is key. I definitely took from that. I think, um, you know, I, actually going out there and, and not, just, not just sort of taking it secondhand, the legislation, but actually getting it from the source and having a look at the case study because... I don't know whether you, what your experience has been, but I've noticed that sometimes there's a bit of a translation between what comes out of the regulator and what comes out of the licensee sometimes. Very much so. Uh, Helen says definitely so. the review process is, yeah, totally, uh, really misunderstood. And I'm running a session next Friday. It's a, usually a members only thing, but if a few people on the program want, uh, who are not on the program want to come along and join and get an understanding of uh, sort of what we do when we work with businesses to renovate their review experience, uh, give me, drop me an email and uh, I can put you down for one of the spots. Uh, Peter says, looking at things from the compliance regulator's perspective, absolutely. Helen just says, thank you so, so much. Pleasure. I think that's for you, dude. Uh, Simon, Simon, I know you've meant, spoken to a great session about making compliance sexy. Thanks for the weekend, weekend reading also. Mate, that's awesome. Uh, as I said, if you'd like to avail yourself of the RM training on the 8th, uh, thank you so much for, for giving that away, sort of free 300 bucks off if you if you like um it's on the 8th of august at 9 a.m it'll be an online thing info at uh, icompliance.com.au did you get icompliance before the iphone or was it around about the same time 
No, it was, well, it was actually a long story, but the short of it is someone just said, oh, I couldn't get integrity compliance, so I got your eye compliance, and I went, oh, okay, thank you. Love it. At least you didn't get the net. That's the worst thing when someone gets the net.au. Yeah. Like, no, no, no. Uh, yeah. Usa says, thank you. Love your work. Love your work too, Ursula. And Elizabeth's ideal client is, I, I reckon that's, that is probably the most, I wasn't expecting you to come out with that. And ultimately, yeah. when you boil it down, it's really easy to build a business for a specific person if you know who that person is. And frankly, if you are solving similar problems for similar kinds of people and you're doing it in a repeatable way, that's that's one strategy to scale. So yeah, I think that's really useful, mate. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Say it was Nadia knocking thank around, you. or is she is she is she gone? Uh, no, she'll be around somewhere. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll catch up with her soon. Nadia for me, and um, we'll, yeah, do. We'll, we'll chat next week. Everybody, thank you so much for joining me. If you're interested in next week's session, or if you're interested in coming to the boardroom session, please drop me an email. Otherwise, have a great weekend, uh, and uh, yeah, stay classy. <laughs> See you, Brad. See ya. Bye.